Hi everyone, I'm Katie Quiller, CEO of Yellow Ladybugs, and thank you so much for joining us. In the spirit of reconciliation, Yellow Ladybugs acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Welcome to this panel discussion dedicated to the career and life advice from creative autistic panelists. Thank you to the NDAA for sponsoring this event, which has allowed us to deliver this content for free. For free. We are thrilled to be bringing our live audience together with four autistic creative spirits who between them have an incredible wealth of lived experience, knowledge and expertise to share with us. A big welcome to all our attendees who are looking to learn from our speakers today and about their journey, turning their creative passions into a career and a way of living and thriving. And to all our neurokin who are tuning in, a big sparkly welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We know that many autistic people are extremely creative and today is all about celebrating this, while also overturning all the myths and stereotypes that continue to exist around employment pathways and career options for our autistic community. In the spirit of busting those myths and in preparation for this panel, we surveyed the Yellow Ladybugs community and in response, we have had over 150 autistic creatives share what they have done in their prior careers. And it was so interesting. And if you're in the chat today, I'd love to hear what previous career or job you've had um, in the industry. I'd really like to hear from you all if you're comfortable sharing that. And it was just amazing to see, and it sort of proved that, you know, what we're, we're talking about today, that the most common um, careers aren't what we think of when we hear autistic individuals. And we had, for example, um, a really huge response from the writing and author community. I think it was over 30% had said that they had done some writing in the past. We had tw over 22% of our respondents say that they were an artist. We had 16% say they were a photographer. And then marketing and advertising um, was about 16%. And then we had some really cool, unique responses. So we had fidget makers, circus art professionals, woodwork teachers, nail technicians, postcard designers, um, which was really fun to see the breadth of the jobs that people have been doing. But today is about exploring some of the stories that sit beneath these statistics. And we did also ask what advice some of our community had, and that's what our panelists are here to talk about today too. Some of the advice that we had from our members and also from our team for people who are wanting to get into the creative space is to build a portfolio, even from a young age. And if we've got links in our resources which will share what a portfolio is, but it can be just a way to show what you've done in the past. Um, it doesn't have to be work-related. It can be in your leisure time. It can be a reel or a video reel, and it really showcases who you are. It's also about your passion and persistence, and it's really about knocking down those doors. And we know as an autistic community, sometimes networking is really hard or sometimes it's not. And to find a way that works for you, it doesn't need to be face-to-face. -face. Um, it could be over LinkedIn or social media. So remember to do it your way. Also remembering those of us with rejection sensitivity, being persistent can be tricky because it can really trigger us when we get knocked back. So we see you out there for those who do have rejection sensitivity. We really encourage finding a mentor and it doesn't have to be someone directly. You can just follow someone you love in your industry and that's another way that um, you, can, you can get some information on the pathway you might choose. And we have heard so many people say that careers have taken them on, the creative industry has taken them on different pathways and change can be tricky for us. Although some of us who are also ADHD thrive on that change as well. So just remember um, the journey can take different ways and that's okay. 
those of us with executive functioning differences, organising yourself might be a bit tricky. Um, so make sure you reach out and get support either from family, friends or a support worker. And don't be afraid to create your own pathway. What we heard from our community is that many of you are entrepreneurs um, and can make things uh, to begin things yourself. So knock those door downs um, or create your own pathway. Cool. <laughs> Some really good advice from our community. So follow what feels good. Don't be afraid to change your mind. Remember that you don't need to be productive or prolific for your creative path to be considered valid. So thank you for the member who sent that through. I thought that was really beautiful. Set boundaries or you might burn out. And again, that's a really important one for those of us in the autistic community who go all in. Lean into your special interests. And today we will hear from our um, panellists about that. And embrace every, every opportunity to explore your soul. You won't know what you like until you try it. And I guess trying and new things is, again, what our panellists might talk about today. And I really love this one. If you're not given a seat at the table, and we really should be given a seat at the table, make your own. And this last one is make sure you work in a healthy environment. And it's, again, about boundaries and looking after your mental health too. So um, what we're also going to send all our attendees is a resource pack, which includes some really awesome, innovative, inspiring neurodivergent creatives that you might want to follow, as well as links to business and grant templates, useful resources and community survey advice and the full advice that we were given in our um, survey. So let's meet our panellists because we want to empower you to focus on your passion and strengths. We know this is an amazing way to live a life aligned to your values, needs and interests. Your pathway may include so many things, whether it's a need for novelty or the drive for autonomy and possibly the practical need for flexible hours or work arrangements. We recognise that there are challenges and today we will cover over those two areas, whether it's rejection sensitivity, as I said, executive functioning load that can come with self-employment and the systemic employment barriers that exist for our community. So in today's discussion, we hope to provide some guidance about how the creative industry can provide amazing opportunities for our neurodivergent community to flourish and also the practical side of what steps you can take if you are beginning this journey or considering a career change. And while we are focusing on career advice, we are sure that our panellists are more, are more than happy to also give a few life advice in there as well. So I've spoken enough from me. We're going to now do a few intros. I'm so pleased to introduce you to um, let's start with Sherry. Sherry is an award-winning digital marketer and founder of the highly successful agency, The Digital Picnic. As an autistic entrepreneur, Sherry has combined her creativity and passion for people to create her dream career. Hi. 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 Um, thanks for joining us. We've also got Clem. Um, Clem is an award-winning writer, author of Late Bloomer, critic, cake maker, cosplayer, author, and overall creative guru. Welcome, Clem. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Hi, thank you. We've also got Chennai, um, who is a dynamic and vibrant autistic art therapist and entrepreneur. Chennai launched Rainbow Muse, an art therapy and psychology practice to help her clients uncover their sparkle in a safe, and neuro affirming way. It's so good to have you here. Hi, thank you for having me. Awesome having you here. Thank you so much. And last but not least, Ashley. Ashley is a creative force to be reckoned with. She's an autistic musician, music industry worker who's been involved within the music industry for 15 years and is currently the vocalist for pop punk, whoops, pop punk band left on screen an art rock duo twin decoy of which she self-manages both under peripheral noise. That's a lot and awesome to have you here, Ashley. Thanks for having me. Uh, the band's called Left On Scene. Sorry, I must have said thank you. <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> well, make sure everyone looks that up, please. Um, it, it sounds like a great band, but thank please you do. so much. 
Thank you and welcome all. So we are going to spend a large chunk of this panel um, discussion between our panelists on topics central to this conversation. And then at the end of the hour, we've allocated some time to your questions in the audience. So make sure that you think about questions and add those in at the end. And let's get underway. So we are going to start with question one and it's directed to Clem and Cherie. How did your career in the creative sector start out? And what is something you wish you knew at the start of your career? Clem. <laughs> oh, well, uh, it's a long story. <laughs> so I started um, working, well, I mean, I guess I was always creative. And so my first real job um, in that industry was as a freelance writer, which I still do to this day, but I started out as a music critic for a street press called Impress, which I think is now called The Music. I think it still exists in some form. Uh, and then that just led to a lot of different stuff. So from there, I wrote about music. Um, I wrote like life stuff, uh, film criticism. And then throughout that, I've also um, returned to screenwriting. So I started doing that first as, I guess, a hobby. Um, and then turn that into work as well uh, and then also have taught uh, in um, costume fabrication techniques and cosplay so teaching people how to use thermoplastics and all sorts of stuff to make costumes this is like five percent <laughs> I've had so many jobs <laughs> but what I wish I'd known I think uh, boundaries was a big one and you know obviously I didn't know I was autistic until I was older um, but I have always struggled to say no to work that I sort of had a feeling when I was being offered jobs, sometimes I'm like, I'm really burnt out. I don't think I'm going to be able to do this to the best of my abilities, but I better say yes anyway. So I think I'm getting better these days at saying, actually, no, I don't have the capacity to do that this week. You know, thanks very much. And maybe I'll suggest some other people, but that would be the biggest one for me is, is fostering a kind of healthy sense of boundaries from the get-go, um, which seems counterintuitive when you're working for yourself because you sort of think, Oh, I have to say yes to everything because that job might not exist next month, but there's always going to be more work. So that would be my big, my big number one. Massive one, um, Clem, and thank you for sharing. Sheree, did you want to add anything about your journey and advice? Yeah, sure. Um, my journey, I guess, um, you know, so much like Clem, so many different jobs before I found the place that I was meant to be. Um, and you know, it was just a confusing, I guess, high school. I hated high school, absolutely hated it. So I got offered the opportunity to grade skip um, and I took it thinking, awesome, I'll be out sooner. That was the only reason um, I wanted the grade skip. Um, and I took it, but unfortunately hit university at kind of, I think I was 16 and a half or something and I was just too young, had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, so my autistic dad picked my degree for me, which was law. Um, and I hated every single day of that first year of law. Um, we got to law of torts and I just remember standing up mid lecture and I'm like, I'm out <laughs> forever. Nice meeting you all. Have a good life. Um, you'll never hear from me again. <laughs> and they basically didn't. So, um, yeah, just obviously really hated that. Um, got a little bit lost there for a bit. Had no idea what I was meant to do after that. I couldn't, my autistic brain couldn't reconcile with the fact that I didn't complete something, you know. Um, so I was just a little bit lost for a little while there. Um, and throughout that lost period, I just started writing. Um, it was the only way I could just kind of make sense of, you know, life. Um, and got picked up by some um, online publications and um, started writing for a living. Um, very clickbaity, kind of sensationalist bullshit, but you know, hey, it was um, food on the table. Um, and yeah, it, I guess, you know, they really liked me because I could write reasonably well, but especially <laughs> um, capitalists love this one, but I could write fast, you know, so they make a lot of money from fast writers. Um, and, you know, I was really appreciated in that workplace because of that. Um, and, you know, ultimately ended out um, heading and merging like the love of writing into strategy. And now I work in digital marketing and have my own agency, which I definitely need raising, you know, two neurodivergent babies. Um, I need so much more flexibility. Um, and now I have just, you know, the honour and privilege of employing, you know, um, yeah, 24 great humans, many of whom are neurodivergent, which is just such a great feeling because now I get to, be what I needed in my own workplaces, um, you know, growing up, <laughs> basically. Um, so yeah, I'm really proud of where I've ended up. 
I think I've got a long way to go. I think I can do better every single day, but um, I know I'm committed to just being better every single day. Yeah. I love that. You're, you're doing an amazing job and thank you for showing that light and um, being that in, in your industry, but beyond. So those who follow you, it's such a refreshing um, agency that you've created and safe workplace for your team. So thank you for that. Um, was there anything else we wanted to add to that question? Um, let me see. We might jump to question two then. Really good advice. Thanks for kicking that off, both of you. Um, so we're going to go to Chennai. Um, what advice do you have for autistic young people or adults listening, of course, on how to turn your passion into a career or how to find a career that will empower them to embrace their passion? Um, sure. Um, I really related to, um, Sherry, what you were saying. Um, I also hated high school and I spent a lot of time in the art lab with my art teacher. Um, I absolutely, I, like, adored her and I would, um, write my own, like, forge doctor's notes to get out of sport and get out of things just so I could be in the art lab. So that was my safe space. And similarly, when I started uni, I went um, um, to do law because I thought um, art is something that is like having my art graded, like this, there was good and bad and A and B. And it, when I was younger, that kind of ruined the fun of art for me, like um, the, the competitive, um, I guess, ob being objectively graded and marked on it. Um, and I thought that I guess was the only option. And once I began, I sort of stopped creating art for a little while. And I afterward and um, ended up in community development and international relations. And that was following my heart because um, I visited a remote um, First Nations community and got to be in community. And I was like, there's something I love about being barefoot on the ground with people. And that's how my career started, like working within, within communities, building things and creating things. So it was a different form of collaborative co-creating creativity. Um, and that sort of led me more into like studying things that were more therapeutic and, but that was initially just talk based therapy. Um, and then I discovered that art therapy was a thing. And at the time that I discovered it, I was in a job I, that wasn't really suited to me. And I used to spend all my time at work, um, drawing with like, you know, young people and clients and different people that, um, came into the space and, at the time, I didn't, while it wasn't art therapy, it was just people making art together, with, which in itself is really healing and therapeutic. Um, but I met an art therapist and had them come in and run a program, and it blew my mind. Um, and I immediately was like, this, this is the next thing, and um, studied that. So um, I guess... Sorry, that's just cut out there. So... While um, that hopefully gets back online, we might jump to Ashley just to um, get her response around advice about your journey. Hi, everyone. Um, just before I start talking, I do, my asthma is playing up at the moment. So uh, forgive me if I start having a massive coughing fit. Um, yeah, so I've been in the arts and the creative industries and performing arts since I was a baby. Uh, my mom is a visual artist. Um, and very much encouraged both my brother and I, who is also autistic, to uh, express ourselves in however way that we need to. Because, like, for example, I wasn't very good at telling people how I felt. So she really encouraged me to, like, write letters and stuff. Um, but as for, like, my journey and how I've started to turn my passion into a career, um, like I started in music when I was in year three doing xylophone. Then in year five, I started piano and musical theatre. Um, theatre definitely helped me learn how to mask, <laughs> which is which, uh, which has been both good and bad. Um, we all know how uh, tiring masking can get. Um, but yeah, I attended the Australian Institute of Music in Sydney 
Um, and I was like, yeah, you know, like do a three year course in two years. Why not? I took three years and didn't finish it, but, um, cause I kept getting sick. I was a vocal major and you kind of can't get graded when you're sick. Um, so I left with my diploma, found out I was pregnant with my son. And then I've been building my career since he was born. Um, I have been, I'm a vocalist in two bands, um, a pop punk band left on scene wearing that merch today because today is actually Oz Music t-shirt day, uh, support actor raising money uh, for musicians and industry workers who've been doing it tough and they've really been supporting the industry over the last couple of years. I love and absolutely adore their work. Um, I started out just volunteering at fest at like festivals and events and stuff like that in getting into the industry side of things and I went to every workshop that I could that Music SA put on so if you're a musician or an industry worker find out what your state government music body uh, is doing uh, Music ACT and Music New South Wales always have amazing things uh, happening there so you definitely get to get to as many events and workshops and get to know your local industry um, don't be afraid to do stuff that's not exactly what you want to do but will help you um, upskill in the long term and the short term so I used to go to workshops that I had absolutely nothing to do with or about but I knew that you know I might hear something or I might meet someone who will inevitably be able to help me with something down the track um, I got a scholarship with Mosh Ticks in 2019 and I studied a certificate for of music industry uh, in music business um, and just said yes to every opportunity that I could even went to Big Sound in 2019 um, my advice is just stay in your lane don't compare yourself to anybody else because uh, there's so many different ways of going about you know building a career for yourself in the creative industries let alone in the music industry like I yeah I I have a music degree in contemporary performance and I have an industry certificate but for me the biggest thing that I've learned is just through meeting people and talking to people and just not being afraid to ask for help um, because, you know, like the creative industries and performing arts, like we're all in it, we're really all in this together and you've got to feel comfortable in reaching out and asking for help because if you don't do, if you don't reach out, um, or participate in community, then, you know, you just kind of there and existing, like we don't, it, like none of the creative industries, uh, can exist without, other people and other parts that are in their own thing like in the visual arts you've got like galleries and exhibitions and stuff like that performing yeah. arts you've got performances and in music you've got the music business side of things you know um like I while I couldn't um perform when my son was really little I built up my industry contacts and got some work there like I self-managed two bands because who best to look after yourself than yourself? You know, I can work at my own pace and if I need to take a couple of days off, I can. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a really interesting point. And I think that what's in common with a lot of, actually, I think all the panellists here is they work, yeah. you either freelance or work for yourselves. Which yeah, and like even when I do like door work and merch work, like there's nothing wrong with saying no. Nothing wrong with saying, no, I can't this weekend. Thanks for reaching out and um, ha having me in mind for this job. Please let me know what comes up next. Like, That's exactly um, what Clem said. Good, good advice. Like might... I've, I've hit burnout so many times. Like yeah. it's, and that's it's hard what's... when you're passionate about something. Yes. And that's what we're hearing about our particular community. So there's the arts community in general or the creative fields, but then the autistic community. Um, lens to it is so critical for this conversation. I might jump back to Chennai just to finish that conversation. I'm sorry we dropped out. That's okay. I just I vanished for a sec just to like make sure it was if my modem was having a little reboot in case 
case um, my internet is failing up. Sorry, Chennai, it's not working again. I'm not sure what's Everybody's happening. face has gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's still playing up with your um, Wi-Fi, but if you pop in the chat what you were trying to say and then hopefully your internet catches up. You can also call um, a phone number and put in the, the codes and stuff and connect your audio via phone as well. Yep, we'll give you five minutes. No rush. We've got plenty of time. We can catch up with you towards the end. Um, so I think we're going to just quickly jump back to Clem, who's going to give us another update on her journey, and then we'll move on to the next. Yeah, I realised that I spoke so fast, which is very me. Um, <laughs> I was like... I've got so much to talk about. I'm quite, I don't want to talk over Cherry. Um, but yeah, what I forgot to mention was my um, higher education journey, which I think is probably relevant as well. So when I was at school, I um, also hated school like everybody else. I spent a lot of time in the art department like Chennai. Um, and so I just kind of applied for what seems like a good fit, which was fashion design. Um, I know it's hard to t tell by looking at me. Uh, and it wasn't what I expected I thought it would be a more creative course so that was why I started writing in my spare time to um, just kind of pass the time um, so I actually deferred that course uh, in second year and then started doing a TAFE course in professional writing but then ironically I was doing enough freelancing that I um, didn't finish that course in fact I failed second semester because I forgot to uh, unenroll myself and I hid the academic transcript for many years um, and then I just went out on my own as a freelancer for a long time. I spent two years in Los Angeles uh, doing entertainment journalism. And that was around the same time that I started taking screenwriting a bit more seriously. So then when I came back to Australia um, in 2015, I went back to TAFE again to study screenwriting. And then a year into that course, um, I was talking with one of my lecturers and he said, look, why don't you try applying for the masters of screenwriting? You, you'll probably get more out of it. So I kind of jumped ship. So I actually ended up getting a postgraduate degree without having ever graduated, which um, was pretty funny. And I found that it was, so I was like in my early thirties then when I was studying early, early to mid. Um, and I think that I was finally ready to do further research and study. I think earlier on, I didn't really know who I was. I didn't know I was autistic. Um, and a lot of the kind of social aspects of university, I really struggled yeah. with. And mm. Even when I was doing my master's, like we still had so much group work. I found that really tricky. Um, so I think, I think that's something that is always worth, that bears repeating because I know a lot of uh, autistic people particularly and neurodivergent people um, more generally struggle with higher education. And I think, you know, a lot of universities are only just starting to get like accessibility in terms of, you know, ramps and wheelchair access. So the idea of there being any kind of accessibility for neurodivergence is still pretty, you know, like I'm doing my, I'm about to hand in my PhD in the next six months. And when I started in 2019, it was a real uphill battle to explain, you know, why the hot desking situation in the HDR lab wasn't a great situation for me same with when I was you know working at a newspaper um, that I was sort of trying to explain to them listen I'm not being a diva it's really destabilizing if I come in and I don't know if there's going to be somewhere for me to see it etc etc so I think um, you know I just wanted to mention that because I, I feel like I made it sound like I then I became a writer and everything's great um, you know I have worked consistently uh, but I think for a lot of that time I've been officially underemployed you know I know my income is you know barely skating above what's considered low income in Australia so I just feel like they're the sort of asterisks that are that are necessary to convey yeah. um but you know having said that I think where I've ended up is somewhere really good but it to not I think what I like to communicate to people is don't feel um you know upset or or down on yourself if you feel like you don't know what you want to do exactly like sometimes it sort of takes a while to try some different things and so variations on a theme. So I'm still writing, but I'm not doing what I was doing when I started. So, so I guess that's like the through line, but working out what was the best use of my skills and kind of Sherry, what you were saying about being able to write fast, you know, all of these things that are really attractive to employers in a digital media landscape, um, which, you know, 
just to go back to that idea of having boundaries, I, I wasn't able to say, well, oh, maybe actually I can't write 30,000 words this weekend. You know, I was just like, better do it. Um, so, yeah, I just I just wanted to also mention all those things because. Yeah, no, Clem, <laughs> exactly. And in the chat, people are agreeing and saying, you know, a lot of the common theme is that we figure it out along the way. We don't always know what we want to do and it shifts and change and the variations between the industry even of what we're doing and that's okay and someone asked about their younger ladybug being 14 and not knowing what to do and will that come it's a journey you know someone said they're in their 40s and still working out what they want to do when they grow up so it's good that we've all got quite similar experiences here and it's hopefully reassuring to those at home that we don't need to have the answers in high school it doesn't have to be linear like what traditional careers look like and what society says we need to look like. So absolutely. So we're going to jump to Cherie and we're going to ask you what advantages has being autistic given you in pursuing a career in the creative sector? And even if you do want to talk about maybe what one of the barriers might have been. Yeah, sure. Um, advantages, I feel like everything that comes so naturally to myself, uh, yes, it's definitely the autistic profile, um, but I only know that as myself, you know, um, is that, you know, um, I find myself in this organisational leadership position and I get these compliments that make me super uncomfortable. I'm not great at compliments, you know, it just feels sometimes superficial or I just like probably intellectualize it too much I'm like oh but you don't you can't say that because you don't really know that two days ago I didn't make a good leadership move so you can't quite comment on these like leadership strengths and so on but um you know actually I have landed on realizing I am a really strong leader because I only know how to be radically accepting um radically transparent um and just anything that you can scroll through freaking LinkedIn or TikTok that tells you that's what a good leader is and I'm like huh you know, um, and it just is the only way I know how to be, you know, um, I would say radically kind, like not um, those TikTokers who, you know, throw a thousand dollars down on an un unsuspecting person in a cafe or something. But I just mean like um, at work, I'll always have a freezer full of food in case anyone's just run out of spoons for the day and just need to take something home. Um, you know to avoid cooking or like just things like that just the smallest things that are radically kind and as it turns out you know um, I've got this competitive edge and competitive advantage compared to organizational leaders that I know <laughs> and see and I just think oh god yuck you know I could never lead a team the way that they do it's just really ruthless you know and hierarchy and ego based and you know just all of the things that I don't have I can't even fake them I'm told you know Sheree you could be a little bit more this or that and I'm like I haven't got it in me mate like if you <laughs> have it somewhere in a little bottle of something um, I'll buy it off you but the truth is I know for a fact even if I were to buy the potion drink the liquid all I'd have is a shit workplace that I don't want to be at anyway you know um and so I love my leadership style. It's very servant leadership based um, and uh, there's no ego. I hate hierarchy um, and it's just, it's just pretty honest. It's, I'm not oh, a top leader. You know? I'm just relating so hard. To you? I'm almost crying. Like uh, I, it's unfortunate we had to create workplaces to have yeah. this. I wish more leaders were autistic because of our empathy and our no bullshit and no hierarchy and no ego and I just I'm just loving it yeah. and people in the in the chat are, are just saying I wish you know I had you as a boss Cherie like oh. and they relate so hard and no compliments are hard um yeah. oh, it's not perfect though that's the thing like what was, the, okay. what was the second part of your question you said something like so is there a barrier that you've had to overcome because of being autistic obviously as a leader but also as a um self-employed yeah I think that the lack of hierarchy sometimes makes me invisible in my own workplace unfortunately I just don't chase it the way other people might for example and so I accidentally sometimes make myself invisible and um I've just got to work a little harder to say hey <laughs> I'm here, I exist, I make an impact. I know it's not always obvious, you know, 
Um, so I think that is, yeah, just sometimes the way I roll, it's um, a little bit confusing to some people. It's not something that they're used to, you know, um, and so sometimes without meaning to, I would um, become, I don't know, just less recognised or feel a little less important in the workplace. Um, and I guess to anyone listening who might be able to relate, I just try to remind myself I might look invisible at the moment, but the visibility would be so bloody obvious if I was no longer here. Um, it would be a case of, ah, we'd miss her because she's gone, you know? Um, and, you know, like there are still every week to anyone who's listening, like I, I, I make mistakes every week. Yesterday I made two cakes for our employee who's going off on mat leave and I thought it was funny, but the PDA was kicking in just a little too hard and the jokes were, you know, <laughs> not completely funny to everyone else unfortunately I thought it was hilarious like I was just um cackling you know <laughs> but yeah just in hindsight I was like oh, okay probably didn't need to take a photo of this slack screenshot exchange type situation and put it on a Ferguson player cake you know <laughs> 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 and my humor doesn't always land but I keep coming back to the fact that I know now I just know that I'd be missed if I was gone so yeah what a beautiful message to those listening at home because invisibility is a common feeling for many of us so thank you so much for that um we're going to try Chennai again let's try let's let's pray to the wi-fi gods <laughs> um hello a am I clearer now and less glitchy um, I'm so sorry. I feel super, super bad because I know this is being recorded and I'm like, I've made the recording have interruptions. Um, okay. am I back to answering the first question. What, what am I answering? Okay. Um, I guess, um, I won't repeat what I said. I'll just, I guess, continue um my advice is one of my favorite things to say is you do you boo um so like doing you the best you can um and like with all authenticity and with like really good intention and um that sounds a little bit airy fairy because um I guess there's like systemic barriers, multiple and intersecting ones for a lot of people who are at the um, intersections of different forms of diversity. Um, so I guess that's where really um, having good support systems and uh, amazing people around you who value you and see you for who you are. Um, I would say also, I, yeah, I know, I, one of my other favorite things to say is that sounds like a them issue, not a you issue. So not internalizing the them issues. Um, and Clem, I can totally relate. I just started my PhD and I have an accessibility plan and it was pull like pulling teeth to get it because um, it's it, it was unheard of what the things I was asking for. But I, I guess I was literally like, I can... I can do great things if you just let me do it differently. The, the energy and the spoons I spend managing sensory overload, executive functioning, all, all the different components to physically be in a space will take away all the spoons I have to share whatever it is I need to share. Um, so, yeah, I guess my advice would be dream, dream and just... Um, surround yourself with people that fertilize your dreams and believe in your dreams and find different ways to make them possible and also have dreams outside of the box and outside of what um i guess capitalism says is possible beautiful advice thank you so much for that um so we might finish off this part of the question with ash we've got we're just good with time for now, but yeah, and what's your advice for pursuing a career um, as an autistic person? Sorry, that was the last question. Oh my gosh. It's the all advantages and barriers. Yes. yes. Well, um, okay. So the advantages. So when I was doing my um, music degree, like my performance degree, um, 
I was very much like, I really wanted to get better at my craft. I really wanted to be, I was, I'm, I'm a giant music nerd when it comes to pretty much everything except for like audio engineering. So that's kind of like my, been my focus for like 20 years, which sounds like a very long time, <laughs> but yeah, like I, because of being autistic um, and having um, also being ADHD, I genuinely don't actually think about other people's uh, opinions of myself. So I kind of just do what I want to do and I focus on what um, I need to do to achieve my goals. I mean, I've been very ambitious for the last like five years. I've worked my absolute butt off to get to where I am now. And I think if I wasn't autistic and didn't have ADHD, I don't think I would have as much focus and drive and just want and need to just keep consuming information and doing what I do because I mean, I can't be, I'm not, I know I'm not the only one that loses track of time when they're working on the thing that they absolutely love. Like, um, I'm also funnily enough, really good at networking because there's this like unwritten kind of rule kind of thing that when you go to a networking event, you can stand on the outside of a conversation waiting to talk to somebody and introduce yourself. So it's not, there's none of that awkwardness. And what I find really funny is when I talk to a lot of, um, and they're not necessarily neurotypical, but the more neurotypical people um, that I associate with in the industry, they're like, I don't understand how you can do this so well. Like, it's so awkward. And I'm like, I know. And like, everybody's awkward in this situation. So you might as well just embrace it. Like I, I'm awkward when I network, like last night at the SA Music Awards, I was going up to people and being like, Hey, how you been? Um, I really want to talk to you about this. I'm going to send you an email. I don't want to talk about it now because it's really loud, but I'll chat to you later. And then I'd walk off like with networking. I'd walk up to someone. I'd talk about what I was doing. I'd actively listen to what they're doing, ask them some questions. Sometimes I already know the answer, but if I have a question, it's a reason to talk to the person. I exchange details with them and then leave the conversation before I run out of things to say. So like nobody knows that I'm actually like really, really awkward when it comes to talking to people. It's just, you put me in a music setting, I won't shut up. But sounds like, like your interest has really helped you use oh, that. Big like time. Big time. Um, same, same, same with, yeah, same with being on stage. Like um, I've been a performer for 20 years. I've been on stage for like quite a lot. Um, and I can both mask and unmask on stage. So when I was doing musical theatre and just theatre in general, obviously you're not yourself, you're a character. You have that comfort of not being vulnerable on stage you know what's going to happen, you know what's supposed to happen, you have a script. But when I first started performing on stage as myself and as a vocalist, it was really hard. I, I can mask and unmask on stage, but over the last couple of years, like I only just found out, like I only just got my official diagnosis five days before I turned 30 this year. Um, but because my seven-year-old son was diagnosed and my 19-year-old brother, who's like my brother who's three years younger than me, got diagnosed when he was 19. So I've I've always known that I was different. I've always known that I was neurodivergent. I just I never had problems with it until like the last couple of years when I was able to completely unmask and realize how much I was actually struggling. Um, an example of uh, a barrier would be <laughs> when I was doing my music degree and we had an audio like an oral exam and there's a metronome in there and one exam they changed the sound of the metronome so my brain went into panic mode and then didn't I couldn't do the exam and then had to run upstairs and be like hey um I didn't do the exam because you changed the metronome like I need to sit it again and that was before that was like oh like eight years ago or something now so like I it just even if you're not autistic or neurodivergent, having accommodations for yourself is really helpful. 
spot on. Thank you for illustrating that so well. So many people relating in the comments. And also this just shows the diversity of our community. Not everyone does need to or like social um, networking. And so it's really good to have different examples. And I'll quickly say for me, I don't have hierarchy in my mind. So I can go up to the prime minister and ask, what are you doing? to better support autistic girls and women. I wish I had that opportunity. But I don't care about who you are. I, I, I see that as a strength because we're all humans and that's my lack of seeing the hierarchy. So, but we're all different because a lot 100%, of- hundred percent, hundred percent. I go up to people who lots of people are intimidated by and I'm like, why? They're just a person. Yeah, I, I guess it just, everyone's different. So it's so good to show, share the diversity here. Thank you so much. We're going to go to question four and we're asking, this is, I think, the final question before we go to our question and answers. And there's lots of questions from those listening at um, home. So we're going to ask them, what's the most important thing we can do to break the existing stereotypes around autistic people in employment? And if we can think of those listening at home, what might benefit them if they're advocating for themselves or their loved one? Um, we might go to Cherie first. Yeah, sure. Um, well, gosh, where do you start? It's such a big question, isn't it? Um, I guess I'll just add my lens where I'm proudly, obviously, employing many neurodivergent folk. And I just think nothing's off the table in terms of accommodations that need to be asked for. Like if there's something that you need that helps you human better in a, um, you know, in a workplace like bring it <laughs> ask me um and I can write a whole list of accommodations but as my son's hopefully future principal said to us last week what's the point of bullet listing out accommodations if they don't suit Cherie Cloonan or my son Max you know um and so what I want from my employees instead is to just ask for what they need. So one needs an 11 a.m. start because her brain's still pinging at like 2 a.m., you know. So she needs a little sleep in um, and then she has a later start, you know. Um, other folks, you know, uh, don't work with our um, spreadsheets all that well and needed them colour coded um, so that their dyslexic brains could make sense of, you know, the straight up effery and some of our spreadsheets you know so that's fine as well and I just think um you know just anything like we if we're interviewing ask us for the questions first don't worry about your processing speed like get the questions first have two days to prepare or whatever longer if you need um you know and so on there's just a whole list so that I could go on and on there but that's just for me like nothing's off the table because I'm trying to build the workplace that I'm not currently getting for my kids in honestly mainstream school settings at least here in Victoria anyway it's just rubbish out there you know um so um you know I, I can at least make it happen from a workplace and then just to speak to stereotypes like please honestly no more repetitive tasks for all autistic people because I've done a job with repetitive tasks and I reckon my soul just about died you know um so we're just so much more than repetition and stereotypical you know yuckiness um yeah you know we make I think I make a good leader so who knew um we're good with people you <laughs> know I can read a room so well and apparently we're not meant to be able to read rooms you know I can read our my workplace so well I know when someone's having a not great day within two seconds of them walking into the boardroom, for example, you know, so yeah, just no more stereotypes because we're all different. It really is a spectrum. Um, and, and instead we've just got to get individual on this, you know, just speak to the individual and their particular Cherie Clone and Max Clone and Cassie Barlow, whatever needs, you know, um, we all need to feel whole in this world. That's really honestly not actually designed all that well for us. <laughs> so well said, so many valid and very important points there. And for those listening at home, obviously our community, but those in positions of extreme influence, including Jobs Victoria or um, other government agencies, please understand we need to create pathways so that it's not just the stereotypical IT repetitive jobs, maths and those stereotypes. And that's why we've invited them to listen today and everyone listening and being part of this hopefully can start shifting this um, narrative because you've ex that example is perfect. Clem, we might jump to you next. What's some things you think individuals or on a wider whole can do to break down a stereotype? 
Um, I mean, I'm doing trying to do my part as an autistic yeah. screenwriter because I think, you know, broader representation is really important. And even I think if you look at the difference between season one and season two of Love on the Spectrum, which I still, you know, is a show that I find um, I have a lot of issues with, but I think the understanding of autism as a spectrum, as an individual condition is improving in general. Um, I think for employers, uh, there are so many barriers to employment for autistic people just by virtue of the way that employment is set up. So interviews are really stressful. Um, not knowing, you know, not getting a visual guide to what to expect when you go for an in-person interview. So even just something like, here's a photo of the front of the building, here's the room that you're going to be in, here's a photo of my face of the person who's going to talk to you. Um, so I think adjusting expectations around the very kind of, you know, ground level stuff with employment. But I mean, for me, you know, it's very hard for me to, to not be um, outwardly autistic, particularly having written a book about it. So, I mean, you can kind of take my advice with a grain of salt in that sense. But I think it's important to be upfront. You know, it is actually illegal to not give you a job because you're autistic. Um, and I think leading with you know, skills uh, with a kind of trying to remove that deficit mindset is really important. I mean, sometimes I think what we talk about in feedback in screenwriting, the shit sandwich, which is <laughs> good thing, not so good thing, good thing. So, you know, I think really differently. I can bring, you know, approaches to a workplace which are really different. I may need some, you know, reasonable accommodations, but I'm also, you know, this, that and the other. So it's like, I think, I think that a lot of employers still think of employing autistic people as, yeah, like Sheree was saying, the data kind of focused approach, the repetitive tasks focused, but also thinking about it as this like huge thing, like how do we accommodate an autistic person in the workplace? What does that look like? It may actually not end up meaning all that much different, um, you know, in terms of accommodations to everybody else in your workplace, but just being open to having that conversation. Um, you know, I've been really lucky in that in my screenwriting career as it has progressed, you know, I'm typically coming into a room as an autistic consultant or writer. So, you know, that's already on the table. But I think, um, you know, just being able to be open about what I need, like, hey, I can't handle it if everybody's got their mics on in the Zoom, you know, um, I might need to have clearer instructions than you think is necessary for a 40 year old person. Like, um, and people are really, um, they're really receptive to that. And I think what then happens is a trickle down effect where they realize everyone in the workplace actually appreciates those accommodations. So, you know, we've had examples where there might be a visual schedule given for, you know, ostensibly for neurodivergent people, but then everybody likes it because they're like, oh, I'm, I'm in this new workplace. I've got 50 new people to meet. It's actually really helpful to have a photo of their face with their name, you know. Um, so oh, I think that's, I think like even having a positive mindset around accommodations is really would be helpful because I think it makes workplaces more pleasant, you know, across the board, but it is, it is especially helpful for autistic and neurodivergent people. Yeah, absolutely. Lots of people agreeing with you in the comments. People are saying yes, clearer instructions. Absolutely. I, I ask for the same and at Yellow Ladybugs, we always do try and give as much detail as possible, even for preparing for this panel. Like, and even then, send the link the day of because I'll lose it from the email. <laughs> so we just get into that practice now. It should just be, hopefully, become common practice, helps everyone. So, um, Chennai, we might go to you next. What's something that you think is needed in society, the employment sector, education, about um, or your advice on self-advocacy? Um, well, I guess... Um like being a, a creative and a creative person, but also working in that like therapeutic space. Um, so often I might sit in a, in a care team meeting with other, in a multidisciplinary team of other therapists and, and hear them talk about um, uh, beautiful humans such as ourselves in a, quite a deficit-based way. And it is completely heartbreaking. And I love to make it really awkward and be like, that's actually not true. Um, hello. Um, but also sometimes meeting parents who haven't been exposed to neuroaffirming practices, who their goals for their children are an approximation towards being neurotypical. And I have to say, unfortunately, I'm not the right person for that. Um, I don't believe in that. I can't, I can't help with that. Um, 
I think really realizing um, autistic communication is multimodal. So even just saying spoken word alone is a thing. Um, so at our clinic, you don't have to, even if you are, have, are able to speak with words, you absolutely don't have to. If you don't want to, you can write, you can draw, you can, you can use your body, you can do whatever makes you feel comfortable. And I think, um, I think we need to work places can think about different ways of communication, different ways of socializing the idea that things need a, a function and a context. So I remember working when I worked in particular workplaces, there were some meetings I just wouldn't go to. Um, and I just personally didn't understand the purpose of sitting for two hours while people discuss things that could have been in an email. You see those memes. So I was just like, I'm not going to do that. And I just didn't. And um, I don't know how or why, but I just never went and no one ever said anything. And I was like, sweet. Um, so making it clear to neurodivergent people, the why, the how, the rethinking how everything is done um, in a kind of um, individualized and person-centered way, which seems like a lot of work, but it's actually not because you get more out of people if they know kind of why. Um, I think the other thing is embracing the messiness of all humans and I'm also a, a late diagnosed person who was only diagnosed because I was like I get you my babies to the kids I work with um, but I remember my workplace prior to that um, sometimes I'd feel overwhelmed and I'd go into the staff room and lie under the table um, and I would just lie under the table flat on the ground and I had a lovely team leader who would just come and be like you okay and I'd be like just need some time and, and people were quite accepting of those, what seemed at the time like quirks. Um, but I just, I just kind of did what I needed to do. Um, and at the, yeah, wasn't really, didn't care too much what people thought because um, that notion of um, fake it till you make it, I was like, I've never really been able to fake it till I make it. So I have to like lie under the table till I make it or um, have squishies, um, be sniffing a squishy in an important meeting with important people kind of thing. Um, and that's, that's okay. So yeah, my advice is let humans be humans and then they will be the best humans. Uh, such good advice, I think. And as trailblazers of each of you speaking today about this, it's going to just become more and more common for people to be themselves in workplaces. We've still got such a long way to go though, but I'm so glad you've had some positive experiences. That sounds amazing. Um, so we're going to finish with Ash on this one just briefly um, because we've got so many questions yeah. at one o'clock. <laughs> yeah, um, I am going to keep this very brief because a lot of this stuff has already been um, like covered. But in regards to breaking the stigma, like for example, um, I may look like someone who could hold a job and just, you know, be in the workplace. Like I haven't actually been employed for an employer um, since before I started university. And that was like 10 years ago. Um, at the end of 2020, I worked at JB Hi-Fi for two months, but did not last because of being overstimulated all the time, the bright lights, I was having meltdowns in the in the toilet, like it, it just wasn't a thing. I think the biggest thing is that we need to stop thinking of autistic people as just science and maths brain. Like I 100% um, fell through the gaps because I could mask, I was interested in music, what I'm interested in and I'm like fixated on and could talk about for hours on end was just seen as quirky or oh yeah you know she's just really into music like anybody you know so yeah I think we also need to provide safe spaces for each other as well like I was talking to a friend of mine recently who because I just don't really mask a whole lot anymore um, I said to her, if you want to practice unmasking, you pick a couple of safe people. And when you're with those people, you just say to yourself, I'm in a safe space. I'm with safe people. It's okay to not mask. And then from there, you just kind of do it more often. Um, and the biggest, and the biggest thing that I did in the beginning when I started unmasking was 
saying what I wanted to say in messages and not going back and editing it until it was like tiny. If I wanted to send paragraphs upon paragraphs to somebody about something, I did. You know, That's don't self-edit yeah. yourself too much. Pick your safe people. Um, show up as yourself. Allow people to meet you where you're at. Don't try and overextend yourself. Just exist. It is such a beautiful thing once you get to that space. Even if you're only in that space for a very short amount of time, it it is such a great place to be. Thank also, you if you have if you have any questions after this, uh, you can find me on Instagram too. Love it. And thank you so much because that also crossed over to a bit of life advice, which is beautiful. So thank you so much for that. Um, so I've got an out question and I know if you, anyone does need to log off now, they're welcome to. We might just continue this for 10 more minutes. I know Cherie needs to head off too, but um, I will put this question up. Um, someone's put a question in saying that they're 35, still trying to get somewhere with their creative writing, but their perfectionism has been frozen for over 10 years. So any tips on that? So I can definitely say something in regards to creativity and being a perfectionist. Sure. Um, any body of work that you're working on um, is a snapshot in time of where you're at. So for me, um, I could be working on a piece of music or a piece of writing like you are over, and just trying to refine it. I'll, I'll release it. I'll let it out into the world when it's perfect, when it's ready. Don't worry about that. Just do your best for where you're at release it because then you have something out there something you're better off releasing something that's not amazing than not releasing something at all just just do yeah. the thing get it out there because as i said it's just a snapshot of where you're at at that time you can always do more work yeah um, really as, cool. as, as a professional writer i would say just read some of the stuff that actually gets paid for <laughs> but yeah i think it's it's um Sometimes I think a bit like Sherry was saying, you know, the volume of work that I've had to create, I didn't really have a chance to stop and think, is this my best work? Uh, but yeah, I think being able to trust that everything is kind of a work in progress, you know, there is no final draft. Um, so try and just start small, you know, find some writing opportunities that are small, short story contests, you know, short essays. There are sometimes, you know, six word story contests. Um, so don't feel like you have to write 80,000 words uh, right off the bat and join a writing group, you know, find some other neurodivergent writers. It doesn't have to be in person, just some kind of sharing circle where you can all give each other constructive feedback or even just read each other's work, I think is really, really Love important because that. that editor relationship is one that you don't get a lot in the industry, unfortunately, just because of the, the, the turnaround of things. So if you can find that kind of um, mentorship or collegiate um, experience with other writers, um, it could be a Facebook group, WhatsApp group, whatever, uh, I think that will really help. Um, and it also stops that feeling of, of being solitary, which unfortunately writing is. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I'm going to jump to another question to Sheree, but just on that, Ebony, Birch Hanger did a great talk for us at our conference on as a perfectionist, autistic or perfectionist, and we'll try and make sure we link that as well because it's a really good point about near enough is good enough and trying to use that mantra as much as you can. Um, I'm, just for timing, I'm going to jump straight to Sheree on this question. So someone's asked managing emotional regulation in the workplace, especially with unpredictability of feeling invisible, how do you effectively manage any of these challenges that you have? If you have them, that's such a good question. Um, I reckon me in twenty thousand, like to sorry, two thousand and eighteen, this calculator kicking in. Um, I would have hated, uh, not hated, no, actually, I think I've always been good to work for, but I just think back to twenty eighteen me, and uh, RSD was just rearing its head far too much, um, and um, I had to do so much work on it. Um, and where I'm at now in 2022, I am so freaking proud, like, you know, um, and I've worked with a consultant on this specifically. She isn't neurodivergent, but I'd say she's a 10 out of 10 ally, um, you know, so that's, that's great, you know, and what she's done for me is mapped it out all visually. So when you're having those big responses, um, sounds a bit toddlerish. I, I really don't mean it sound like this, but they say that it's in, in the red zone. 
Um, and so when I'm feeling those red zone feelings, I just name them inside my head, you know, and I'm like, oh, I hate this feeling, you know, just the feelings of rejection or and in the creative industry, I'm rejected daily um, and I'm disliked online like daily, you know, that's just the bigger the visibility, the more you're seemingly disliked. Um, and um, what I've tried, to, I love seeing the end game and the end game for me is on this same chart making myself get to the blue zone um, which is a really constructive place um, and it's a it's just you know um, it doesn't it honestly doesn't feel ableist it doesn't feel like I'm not owning you know my autistic profile but the blue zone feels so much safer healthier feels like I'm a much better employer feels like I'm a much better person I'm even having some ripple effects on my marriage and my kids which was a happy little side bonus wasn't expecting that but I'm sure Dave's thrilled you know um so yeah I just I know what to do now when you are and I just ask for particular accommodations and one of them the biggest one is just I need 48 hours to respond to that you don't want the response right now because <laughs> you know I'm just I'm that. not I'm, yeah 48 hours honestly um don't rush take your time own it you're not a shit leader if you need a little more time to honor that processing speed and get out from red to blue you know um and I'm just much more honest now so name it all have a name for how you're feeling it's usually always um autistic specific for me um and then just get into a, a better spot yeah love that thank you for such specific advice I really love it um so Chennai um how do you I don't know if this um is something that relates to you but we've had a few questions around burnout and obviously all of you are, are self-employed or freelancers how do you balance paying the bills and burnout Tim, um, um I guess um my my overall advice um when I plan what my life looks like, um, it, it is, I, I generally keep things simple um, as far as what I need in the world. Of course, we all have our basic needs which need, to be, which need to be met. So when we talk about bills, we might just be talking about basic needs. Um, but when I think of additional things, um, I've never been someone who needs $800 handbags or, you know, um, things like that. Um, so firstly, like living a life um, that is as um, simple as possible so you never have to overextend yourself for things that will potentially be harmful um, because it's, um, it's a thing I see in general in the world so much um, consumption they need to work more to consume more they need to consume more to feel better from working more and that kind of thing um I am I do I am pragmatic and a good planner and um and saver so I think I'd say um it's always we with seeking support it's not just like emotional support or friend support we can talk to people to help us with our finances so um for people who might be struggling with their finances that might be a financial counselor for people who aren't it might be a an uh, advisor or whatever so like we don't have to know everything but we there are people who know the things that we don't know um I guess the burnout component I have experienced burnout um uh, multiple times in my career um and I've learned from it um I've learned from it and just try my best to have a life I don't need a holiday from even though I currently need a holiday um but it's just, yeah, it's just been a really busy time. So embedding as many things into my regular schedule um, that care for me. Um, the biggest thing, and I did see someone in there ask me how I manage um, something like, I guess, with being a therapist. And I think um, freeing myself from imposter syndrome by not claiming to be something that is impossible. Um, when I work with someone in a therapeutic setting, um, the idea that there is a helper and a helpy and something is going to happen in that dynamic. I'm just like, I learned some stuff at uni, which might be helpful. I can tell you some of it, but like, let's work it out. And if it's not working, you can find me and that's okay too. Cause I only can do what I can do. Um, and then it's like, ah, like, um, I am not an expert. I'm not a, I'm, I'm yeah. All those kinds of things. And I think the, the hustle, hustling for our worthiness, as Brene Brown calls it, um, often leads to, can lead to that, that overextension. So um, it just boils down to 
holistically living the, the best kind of possible life I can um, with assistance where I need it. And yeah, keeping it real. Love it. I love keeping it real. I love the transparency you talk about. It's amazing. It's really validating to hear others are, are similar and hopefully, you know, many in the chat are relating to. Um, I love all the little side comments that our panellists are putting in. So thank you. <laughs> really funny stuff I'm reading. So it's really cool. The connection we're making here today is amazing. Um, for those at home, thank you for joining us. I think we've probably got to the end of our questions, um, but we might, we might share um, some more answers on our socials and you, each, of, each of you who have attended will receive an email link to the recording so you can go back and listen to all the incredible advice that's been shared and also a resource document which will include over 100 quotes from our autistic adults on having, building or aspiring to a creative career. This is sort of like the tip of the iceberg. We've really just touched the surface. Honestly, we could do a whole three-day conference on this. I mean, hello, if the government's listening, we need to invest in this space because, you know, I don't know about those listening at home and our panellists, we've got such a long way to go and I haven't really heard a lot about autistic creative careers even discussed. So this is like one of the first things I've seen in this space. So. Thank you, pioneers, for being part of this, our panellists. Is there a final comment you want to say? We've got probably a minute left. So that I'll say thank you to each of you. Thanks for having us. Um, oh, one thing that I, that I will say, because we, we have run out of time, um, a lot of the work that I do behind the scenes is all about putting on events that are safe for lots of different disabilities accessible in many different ways like myself I can't use stairs so I try and uh, book events and gigs in places that have lifts or minimal stairs or stuff like that um, a lot of the, like I advocate for uh, no smoke machines no strobe so that's in our rider for all of our gigs that we do because I'm asthmatic and also um, being autistic strobe just is all oh, yeah um, but yeah just don't be afraid to advocate for your needs um, you, and you know what that's a clear good clear concise communication yeah. will get you very very far thank you and that's a good point about our, our needs are sometimes invisible and accessibility is so important but I will say just to thank you to sum it up great advice Anyone that does want to follow these incredible panellists, we're going to send links to their socials as well so that you can follow them and they can be your online mentor in a way because they've got so much to share. Thank you, Clem, so much for joining us again and being a regular at Yellow Ladybugs. Thank you. And I wanted to just say a quick thank you to anyone who came today who's not in the club. Um, you know, if there's anybody here who is an employer or, as Sherry said, a 10 out of 10 ally, um, that's great. You know, in future, it would be really amazing to get like 350 non-autistic people in an autistic seminar. So good on you if you're a, if you're a thought leader on that front. Yeah, thank you, Clem. Good point. And it was so good to introduce you, Ashley and Chennai. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be seeing more of you, I'm sure, at Yellow Ladybugs events. Um, and I, from here, I'm going to be drawing you your picture. Yeah, we were <laughs> to say to express my feelings and how it felt to do we this with you. Thank that. you. We will share that with our community and <laughs> somehow get it up at Yellow Ladybugs headquarters because we want to have as much autistic creativity around us um, as a pretty fully neurodivergent team. We just love everything about our community. So thank you so much. And thanks for listening at home. Please share this because the more we can amplify, we've been live tweeting today. So if you're on Twitter, make sure you share it. Thanks for joining in um, and thanks for, for coming along. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.